Hey everyone, thanks for tuning in to Seeker Plus again today. I am Trace, and this is episode two of three in our series about meat. Last episode, we talked about meat being the flesh of animals and how you define meat and what meat really is, and you have to go back to figure out you know, more about that. Make sure you watch that episode. It came out last week. Uh, but this week, we're going to talk about whether meat could be vegetarian at all or vegan and what's happening in the world of lab-grown meat. And we've got an interview to help us with that. So welcome, everyone. This is senior food editor at Thrillist, Kushbu Shah. Hi. Yay. So uh, we're going to talk a lot about that over the next 15 or so minutes. So stick around. Again, make sure you subscribe. Let's kick into it. So Kushbu, you're writing a thing about how meat could be vegetarian, like lab-grown meat? Yeah, so when I first heard about lab-grown meat, which was probably about f four or five years at this point, um, I grew up in a completely vegetarian family, actually. So my first instinct was like, oh, is this something that like we could eat? Uh, and so I wanted to set about, you know, asking various people about that, but there wasn't enough familiarity. So now, the, you know, recently um, we asked like PETA, we asked scientists, I asked a religious expert, like from different points of views, like whether they think lab-grown meat could be vegetarian, and the answers were so across the board. So a little bit about lab-grown meat, for those who don't know, it was first created in 2013. It took about three months to grow it, and mm -hmm. it was invented by a Dutch scientist named yeah. Mark Post. Do you know much about like that creation story? I know it took a lot of like work to figure out how to do it. So I think the way they did it was they were harvesting cells from the muscle of a cow, mm -hmm. which they said is a painless process for the cow, but how do you actually know? I yeah, don't know, yeah, it's yeah. a gray area. Um, they cultured the cells and then they fed them so that the cells replicated, replicated, replicated. And then you had, you know, basically a whole like petri dish of cow cells. But here's the thing, it's missing fat, it's missing the other things that kind of go into a burger. So he mixed it with egg. Mm. And I think one other binder, I forget the name of it, to create sort of the first, you know, meatless patty, the meatless mm. burger. Though a lot of people referred to it as sort of like a, a dry tasting like animal puck, which right, yeah. I don't think is the ideal burger type. Yeah, if you read but... the like description <laughs> of people who are eating it, they they didn't really give like rave reviews, but they said it tasted meaty. Yeah, they said it tasted meaty. I mean, considering that it was over three hundred thousand dollars to create one little you know puck, that's a little bit expensive for yeah. for the taste. It uh, is, yeah. But, I mean, it's interesting that it was like a proof of concept that it actually worked, it actually happened. I read that, uh, according to Big Think, um, they've gotten the price down to about $11.36 per puck, I guess you could say, <laughs> right? Um, but, you know, there are mm, benefits pucks. to it, aside from the vegetarian thing, like just to kind of sidebar for a second. It conserves water and energy. Mm -hmm. It's better for the environment in that respect. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions because you're not raising all of these livestock only to then take them and slaughter them and to make them into... Yeah, I think livestock is responsible for like 15% of man-made greenhouse gas emissions, which yeah. is, oh, that's a giant chunk. It's a lot. It's a lot. So when you were talking to all these people about the kind of ethical feelings of lab-grown meat. And if any of you have your own opinions on that, please, you know, let us know in the comments. But PETA said when they tried lab-grown meat for the first time, or when people tried it, that they called it a success. And they said it was a big deal. And, um, you know, who I, determines the ethics of this? I, you, that's actually really interesting, because PETA is an organization that is so pro-vegan, not even vegetarian. And mm -hmm. I, I feel for, like, a lot of people that I talk to, some lifelong vegetarians, some scientists and stuff, they, some chefs, they were like, okay, we can see how this could maybe be vegetarian, because you're just, you're not killing the animal, you're just harvesting, like, cells from it, and then going through that process. But it's interesting that PETA has actually funded a lot of this research for mm -hmm. lab-grown meat, and they made this conscious decision to sort of blur the lines a little bit and actually, you know, pursue something that might be considered vegetarian and not vegan, because to them, stopping the slaughter of animals was just that important. And they realized that, you know, they could maybe not stop the world from eating meat, but if they could give them an alternative source that doesn't harm animals, like that was closer to their cause uh, than, you know, not supporting it at all. So PETA is actually really instrumental in funding a lot of this lab-grown research. I think it's super interesting to think of lab-grown meat almost not as meat, even though it comes from it. It, it seems like we're putting it in this new gray area. Yeah, it's, I mean, it is sort of missing a lot of the things that meat has. Like, it is, it's one 
part of the meat that you usually see, you know, mm -hmm. like it's missing the fat, it's missing these like muscle striations, it's missing the blood, it's missing all these other things that contribute to the flavor of meat. So if all of those things are not there, is it really meat at the mm -hmm. end of the day? Like, cause they all have to be added back in sort of after. Yeah, yeah, they do. So I guess to kind of re-ask the question, like what do, what do you think in terms of like the ethics of mm -hmm. something like a lab-grown burger? What, what have you kind of discovered or revealed by your conversations? Yeah, so I think right now where we're at with lab-grown meat technology, we're pretty far from it, you know, meeting the ethical arguments that people want it to meet, at least when it comes to lab-grown beef. Like, the most successful way that people have found so far is when you culture cells, you need to feed cells something for it to grow, right? right? So. The most common way right now is using a serum from like fetal bovines. So from you have to kill baby fetus cows um, to get this serum. So yeah. is that still really ethical at the end of the day? I don't know. I don't think so. You know, and that maybe isn't so vegetarian friendly. Right. When you do still have to slaughter an animal to get there. But if we can get around this, you know, then I think maybe it does meet this ethical requirement of a lot of people who are vegetarian for those reasons, you know, sure. for environmental reasons, for the they don't want to harm or kill animals. You know, if there's no actual physical harm being done to these animals, then sure, I don't see why it wouldn't be an option for people who agree with that. Yeah, yeah. And I feel like the ethics for me are just all mixed up in all sorts of other things, especially doing the research for these episodes about like what meat really is and isn't. A lot of it is, as I've said already, what we say it is. Mm -hmm. And since it has such a cultural connection to so many different groups around the world and such a religious like connection, you can't yeah. disconnect those things from what meat is, right? And where that meat comes from. So let's say we lab grew meat from a chicken mm -hmm. versus a pig versus a cow. Could different cultures eat different ones and feel differently about them? Of course they can. Right. And they will. Even if we spend all this time and money to grow it, there's still going to be these like cultural touchstone. Just because technically you can eat something doesn't mean that people are necessarily going to be comfortable with it. Like Absolutely. I talked to someone who is a Hindu scholar and mm -hmm. obviously in Hinduism, you know, cows, at least in modern Hinduism, cows are, you know, considered relatively sacred. And I think even just cutting into the animal and harvesting its cells is, and just eating something that is from a cow's body, I think is just still too much for people to wrap their brains around. Mm -hmm. I mean, my mom is incredibly vegetarian, has always been for religious reasons, for cultural reasons. And I distinctly remember growing up, like we had bought some of those, you know, fake soy corn dogs. And like, she could not bite into it just because it was still just it was like a too meat close. Stimulant. Yeah, yeah. it's too close. And she's like, I, I just don't want to eat dead animals or anything that represents that, you know, yeah. or anything that's remotely close to it. It has that texture. I think texture is going to be sort of yeah. one of the biggest things and one of the biggest hurdles that lab grown meat is going to face. If you have this texture in your mouth and it doesn't, it tastes right, but it feels wrong. Yeah. It almost reminds me of when you're, you have like VR goggles on <laughs> yeah. and you're, you're looking around, but your ears aren't moving the same way they're supposed to and you get sick. It feels mm -hmm. that same way. You get that like kind of internal sense of something is wrong and I don't know what's going on. If we make this the future of meat, mm -hmm. which is what people are talking about, they're going to have to solve a lot of these issues to get people to want to consume it. Totally. I mean, there's there's been some success with lab-grown chicken, but like one of the biggest complaints with that is that it has the flavors of chicken, but the texture is like very spongy. It's wrong. Ooh. Like, like spongy. Spongy chicken. I don't want to think of spongy chicken. <laughs> like no matter how much sauce or how much you deep fry it, like <laughs> it still just like won't won't save that. I don't know about that. I feel like if I deep fried it, it would <laughs> be good. <laughs> Here's the thing with lab-grown meat is that there's not, there hasn't been enough of it created for us to fully study it too. Like we don't know what the total environmental impacts of it will be. We hope that it'll solve pollution problems. We hope that it'll solve like land use problems. But we haven't, there's no system or process that has been mastered yet that we know is 100% going to work and 100% going to bring us to the point where lab-grown meat is going to be totally widespread. And there's studies that are conflicting, you know, mm -hmm. about this. Like some say that lab grown meat is pretty much equivalent to the greenhouse gas emissions of the European pork industry, um, which is lower than the United States, but that's still, that's still emissions, emissions, right? Yeah. I don't think we will ever as like human beings stop eating regular meat. I think it'll just become more and more of a precious commodity. Animals will still be around. We'll still use them for things in the same way that now we have like 
super expensive cuts of beef mm-hmm. that, you know, like Kobe beef and stuff that people do this very special rituals with. Yes. It, it, right now, we don't really have that feeling in a lot, of, especially in the West, about how we think of our meat. It's like so disconnected from the food chain itself that it's it's just a commodity that we buy for 12 cents or whatever. <laughs> um, and and it, maybe it shouldn't be 12 cents. You know, maybe it should be more expensive. And that's something that maybe lab-grown meat might Mm -hmm. bring in like, oh, well, we can make this for 12 cents, but we probably shouldn't be growing cows for 12 cents, like growing livestock. Exactly. And we forget that the livestock industry is also connected to so many other peripheral industries. Like, what about the fashion industry? They rely on leather. They rely on that. I mean, there is lab-grown leather that's sort of happening, which is kind of interesting (laughs) and weird, too, um, which I think probably has less issues than lab-grown meat because you don't really need flavor. You just need the right texture. But, you know, animals are also used in pet food. They're used in the cosmetics industry. Like, they're used in so many other applications, like glue, you know. Mm -hmm. So if we stop slaughtering those animals completely, what does it mean for all these other industries that are also associated with it? We can't forget about those either. Yeah. I mean, how am I going to eat Jell-O? I hate Jell-O. I don't really like Jell-O. I think we'd all maybe be better with less less Jell-O around. Why is it so difficult for us to move people toward vegetarianism is, I guess, Mm -hmm. a question that I keep asking myself. Not that I'm not a vegetarian. I have Mm. tried being a vegetarian. I liked it. I enjoyed it. I felt nice, like, about myself and what I was eating. But I was also still, like, worried about not eating the right things or missing things in my diet or, you know, stuff like that. So why is it that it's so hard to get people to be vegetarian, do you think? Well, first Mm. of all, I don't think people like being told that they can't eat something. Mm. Like, Mm. once you start putting restrictions on something, because there's even a lot of vegetarians who have, like, will poo-poo on, like, veganism because they're, like, they don't like the idea that they can't eat you know, the certain set of foods, even though they're so, they're just one step away, you know? Right. Um, So I don't think people like restriction, but I also think it's a culture thing. You know, when you look at cultures outside of the West, especially, especially in the East, like it's really easy to be vegetarian because everyone around you is vegetarian. All your meals are set up to be super satisfying. Like it's a way of eating that you understand. It's not taught to you that you need meat, potatoes, and a vegetable on your dinner plate. Like there is stuff set up in society to make it very easy to be vegetarian. Like, Mm -hmm. it's a little bit harder here. You might go to a restaurant if you're vegetarian, then you're stuck with, you know, a plate of, like, sides. And, like, that's all you get. Like, people don't know how to necessarily cook it. But, you know, you go to India and, like... Potentially over time, maybe, that meat, the way we think of it now, could change if it's cultural. It just takes lots of time and maybe more options that people would have. Totally. Like, we're still living with that post-war idea that we can put meat on everybody's plate Mm -hmm. every meal, which we couldn't even have said at the turn of the previous century, right? (laughs) Yeah. It's like right before World War II, we weren't saying, like, meat on everybody's plate. That's the best. Exactly. And so it's really just the last 60, 70 years we've gotten here. And I think that's a lot is tied in with marketing as well. Like, this idea, especially, you know, in the U.S. and in in Europe, of, like, meat is associated with manliness and, like, Mm. strength Mm -hmm. and, like, power over animals. And so, and vegetarianism sort of has this idea of being a little bit meeker, you know. Mm. It's not necessarily the the truth or the case. It's a little more like a masculine-feminine battle. Exactly. Like, salads are feminine and meat is masculine. This whole, you know, has been perpetrated for for decades at this point. But I think that's sort of hard to break through. It is, yeah. I wanted to like kind of end on something that's just crazy. Okay. <laughs> let's let's just run with me on this, everybody. Okay. So if meat that is grown in a lab is more ethical, mm-hmm. and part of the ethics problem with like slaughtering animals is we're killing animals, we're harming them. Mm-hmm. Um, so if I can take cells from, let's say, a fictional animal for the moment, a hypothetical animal that is willing to give the cells and can provide consent somehow, Mm -hmm. would those cells then have come from an ethical source? And then I could grow them and create an ethical piece of meat. If you could grow them ethically. If I could grow them ethically as well. Yeah. Um, And I was thinking about this while I was putting together this episode, and there's really just one animal that can do that, and that would be human. (laughs) (laughs) So if I could give my cells and consent to that, and then we could grow them ethically, would that not be the most ethical piece of meat that one could consume? Thoughts? I, you know... I'm not saying I would eat it. (laughs) I'm not saying that. I'm just saying could. I think ethics-wise, it might be the most I mean you're consenting I guess yeah right so a trace burger would be ethical 
I don't. Sorry, not to diss you. I'm sure it's it would be delicious, delicious, but it could also so be tasty. Terrible. I mean, it's the whole thing of wrapping your. You know how vegetarians can't wrap their brains around eating things that are the texture of meat. Mm -hmm. I don't think most humans can wrap their brains around eating something that's like texture of, of another human. Especially this one. <laughs> Especially that one. <laughs> I mean, though, deep fry it, enough cheese. You know what, again, back to the deep fry. We might, we might get there. You know, a little aioli. Technically, like. it wouldn't be illegal. I looked that up. That in, oh. the, in the U.S., there are no laws against cannibalism. They did say that um, most, if not all states, have made it impossible to obtain human meat legally. But to consume it is not technically illegal if you could obtain it in a way like a lab growing grown, in a cell, yeah. Thing. So this is according to Cornell Law School. So uh, I think it's pretty interesting. <laughs> I think the idea here is a better solution than eating human, yeah. <laughs> uh, which just might be to minimize meat in your diet. In doing all the research for this, that's the conclusion I keep coming back to. Like the idea of lab-grown meat is that we just don't want to cut down our consumption at all. Like apparently Americans eat something like seven thousand full animals in their lifetime, which is <laughs> low key insane. That's a full wow, farm. That's a lot um, of animals. That's a lot of animals, and and I'm just, it's an average. So some people are eating way more than that. To get around that problem, we want to do this like crazy expensive solution. Like when the, there's another solution in front of us, like maybe let's just eat a little bit less of it, mm -hmm. and like let's eat like higher quality sources of it. Let's eat like six thousand animals. Yes, yeah, just like, like just six thousand. Yeah, even even sixty five hundred. Like, yeah, you're eating like a little less meat. That's a big deal. Yeah, I, I think you can really that make a, a big impact. difference. And it doesn't. It yes, there are economic factors to eating less meat, but it depends on all these other factors too, as you were saying that like the livestock industry and the farming industry has so many different moving parts mm -hmm. and so much changes so often that if you eat a little less meat, you shouldn't feel bad for the livestock industry. <laughs> and you're going to feel better for other industries. It's similar to like green energy. I yeah. feel like, yes, we could keep burning coal because it's easy. Right. Or we could try creating a whole new system that is friendlier to us and to the earth. Mm -hmm. Definitely. And here's the thing. It's getting a lot easier to have one less meat meal a week. You know, there's a lot of chefs that are working to do things in that space. A lot of them are, you know, working really creatively with turning uh, plant-based, like, vegetables mm. and treating them and cooking them like you would cook meat. So the result is something that's actually mimics a lot of those flavors, a lot of those textures, but it just happens to be made from, like, a fruit or vegetable. And that kind of brings me back to where we were at the end of the last episode which is <laughs> meat, it could potentially be what we say it is, whether it's lab-grown, whether it's plant-based, whether it's simply like a mixture of all of these different strategies. Meat in the future could be very different than it is now. I agree with that. Thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Thank you for coming in. Thanks for having me. so great. Me. If people want to like follow you on Twitter or Instagram or something, where can they find you? Yeah, I'm at Kushan OJ on both of those platforms. So that's K-H-U-S-H-A-N-D-O-J. Uh, it's a little riff on my favorite mixtape. So. I like it. I like it. <laughs> um, and you can find me on Twitter at Trace Dominguez. You can find us at Seeker. You can also, of course, subscribe here on YouTube. We'll be on iTunes very, very soon. Uh, make sure you come back next week because next week we're going to talk about what meat actually gives you like what in your body you get because you eat meat and whether or not you need those things and it's going to be really interesting so make sure you come back for that thanks for watching seeker plus everyone we'll see you next time